Hi, this is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. And this will be part 333. Our lesson today is continuing Prototokus Advent, the coming of the Prototokus, part 3. <coughs> We've been teaching the Bible <coughs> instructs the saint to prepare for his position in heaven. Now there are two saints, two classifications. Those that were called from eternity and those that were called in this life. <clears throat> we want to take a look at the classification of what's called the priest who has an eternal call who is Sorry. part of the group of the sons of God called the Prototokis, that is the assembly of the firstborn. We want to take a look at what the scripture says dealing with the priests. Now scripture <clears throat> indicates like the elder group, the priests who are angels, We'll call from eternity. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 29 to 30. <coughs> Romans, the 8th chapter. Yes. Romans 8, verse 29 to 30. Here we have <coughs> the presentation of a course that the Father took before the <coughs> onset of the creation. Nothing was created at this time except what had been spoken into being the eternal creation. <clears throat> there was no earth, no human race, no physical. There was only the glories of the eternal, <clears throat> the angelic hosts, <clears throat> God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, starting in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. There's no to be. To be is in italics. It's not in the original Greek. The original Greek doesn't have it. It just says it did predestinate conform to the image of his son, that he, his son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'm going to focus on the word foreknew. Uh, basically what it's saying is <clears throat> the father had a relationship with certain members of the creation at this time. He favored them. He determined that he wanted to raise them to the level of sonship, which is what he did. He elevated them to the divine level. He determined in their being elevated that they would be molded in the image of his firstborn son. <clears throat> Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. We want to take a look at this. This is very important. <clears throat> For the predetermined on an individual basis, those he had chosen and elevated, <clears throat> he then called them by name to himself. Now this calling included many things. <clears throat> it <sighs> encompassed what they would partake of 
In other words, the position, what position of sonship they would enter into. It included <coughs> the ability, the administrative talents that would be incorporated in them. It included the position that they would occupy. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this calling. Turn to Matthew, 24th chapter. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Verse, starting in verse 45. Four to five. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Twenty-four. Who then <clears throat> is a faithful and wise servant? Who then is a faithful and wise servant at this time? What is this time? The beginning of sorrows. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, kingdoms of the world collapsing. At this time, <clears throat> who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household? When did that happen? When he called them in eternity. He made them ruler over his household. That was part of their call. To give them meat in due season. What does that mean? There become a time when his calling included feeding the household of God. The word of God. In eternity, God <coughs> determined a group that he elevated to the position of sonship out of the creation, made them part of the creator, the creator's son position, and called them to receive an, an identity. They would be identified either as an elder or as a priest. A elder would be given specific duties, specific characteristics, specific tasks pertaining to rulership in the kingdom. The priests would be called to be the teacher, the scholar, the judge, giving discernment and direction to the creation. That person is referred to here as a faithful and wise servant who at the time of his calling on earth will step into the work that has been laid out for him. In other words, he would have been prepared to feed God's household at a specific time. Now, what we want to take into consideration, go back to Romans 8, verse 30. You know, this is... Uh, not something that's easily, doesn't go down easy. But hey, if you can identify with this, it's worth everything you've got to get on, grab it, and run with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Romans 8, verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Everything was done by the Father to this person in eternity. His life, his position in the, in the family of God was predetermined by the Father. His place in the kingdom was predetermined by the Father. Everything was set in motion. Yes. I just want to bring it to your attention, ladies. He's speaking this out in past tense terms. It's done. Already did it in God's mind. It's done. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now we want to take a look at this group. Call the priest angels. Scripture indicates because of their calling they have been given an intimate relationship with the Lord. Exclusive relationship. Very intimate relationship. Turn to Revelation the first chapter verse 16. <clears throat> And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. We want to focus on the stars in his right hand. <clears throat> Anything on the right hand of God symbolizes close contact, <clears throat> intimate relationship. When the Lord ascended from the earth after his resurrection, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's right. Closest relationship. When you are positioned in the right hand of God, you can't imagine anything closer than that. In eternity, everybody is going to have a position relative to the Father. <clears throat> Some are going to be closer than others. Amen. Yes. Okay, Mr. Jones. Following your statement, nothing is closer than the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. So now, what if one becomes the bride? Is the bride on the right hand side or is that a, a, a communion with the Father? And the bride is in a unique position in the Son, which is as close as, as anybody ever gets to the Father. So if you're in the Son, you're not on the right hand, you're in intimate uh, 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 context part of the Father. Yes, he is, but the bride is within the son. Okay. So then he's at the right hand of the father. No, he's within the father. Mm -hmm. I and you, you and me. I understand what you're saying. I'm comparing it to those who are not the bride. Mm -hmm. The Turk is at the right hand of the father. Yes. The bride is more writer. No. Or, okay. No, because you can't. Right hand is still in a position, just a minute, it's still in a position vis-a-vis -vis who the Father is. The Son is in the Father. The Bride is connected intimately to the Son. So it's not a comparable closeness at that point. It transcends that. Praise the Lord for your wisdom. 
Mr. Smith. Okay, so let your wisdom uh, give us the understanding of what I'm about to speak out here. So now we see in Scripture, in Revelation says, to he that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcame and am sat down with the Father in his throne. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus is sitting in God's throne, I'm sitting in Jesus' throne, where does that put me? It puts you in Jesus. Okay, but... Are, are we not also in the Father? Yes. <clears throat> but that has to do with a position vis-a-vis -vis in a relationship, an intimate relationship, which you can't get any further than the right hand of the Son. So there's the Father position, then there's the bride, or the, there's the Son position, and then there's the bride position. Yes. And is one higher than the other? <clears throat> when the bride becomes part of the son, she becomes co, <clears throat> how can I put it, part of the father as the son is. Mm. Because she's a consort of the son, the two become one. So it's one. So the bride enters into a position that the son shares with the father. So the relationship of the bride is that of the son? Yes. As the father would say, there's yes. no, no separation. <clears throat> exactly. In the same way you would say, there's no separation between the father, the son, and the Spirit. Exactly. Mm. Yes. Which can't be it can't be measured from a position of right hand, distant, closer, or whatever. Right. You are in. But once you're talking about beings who no longer have a beginning and end, that family is, is inseparable. Yes. Irrespective of me. Yes. What relationship? But the connection one? is unique, distinct. Each one has a distinct uh, identity in their relationship, in their connection to. And in this respect, <clears throat> somebody who is on the right hand of the son has the most intimate relation they can outside of being the son. Right. But well, let's go on. Because we don't want to lose anybody here. Uh, we'll do one verse 20. Yes. Okay. Now, what we're looking at here, and again, I, I don't see here any questions, so I think we lost you guys. No, I, I got him. Jesus says, if you see me, you've seen my father. He's in me. No, no, I'm in him. No. But you're talking about. No, no, no. No, don't try to smooth it over. You, you lost us. You lost us because if you didn't, you'd be asking questions. That's all right. It's okay. It's normal. It's natural. And it's something that this isn't going to be easy to understand. Well, isn't it like the, but like in, within us, be the spirit and our soul and then our, and our, like the three, the tripart of the human being? Kind of like that? It has nothing, to do, nothing to do with us. Has everything to do with the Father mm -hmm. and the Father's will mm -hmm. for something that you haven't achieved yet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're on the way to achieving if you understand it. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're saying here basically deals with the groups that the Father called from eternity. We said that there's three. Mm -hmm. There's the elders, the there's the priests, angels, and there's the bride. Each group is unique. Each group has its calling, its duties, its relationship to God. Now, this group that we're talking about, the elder group, <coughs> was one. The angel group, we said, <coughs> has a unique relationship to the Father that the elder group does not, in that it is far more intimate in the Father than the elder group is. Why? <clears throat> because of its function. Because of its duties. Because of its position. It has what we consider to be <clears throat> a deep understanding of God, a deep connection with God, 
that even their brothers, the elders, do not have. Now, we want to follow up on that a little bit. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. I make it too simple, Richard. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as an example, Scripture teaches the true church has an intimate relationship with the Lord. We're going to talk about the church in general. <clears throat> Turn to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 25 to 27. Um, Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Oh, 26 and 27? Uh, 25 to 27. Oh. Now, Paul here relates the intimacy of the church to a man being intimate with his wife. He's relating it to <coughs> the closeness that the two have. You there? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So he's talking about this relationship where the man would give everything for the woman because of his love. That he might sanctify it and cleanse it the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So he's talking about this deep love that the Lord has for the church, where he would sac sacrifice himself for it, where he wants an intimate relationship with it as a whole. He loves every member of it. How much does he love every How does he see every member of it? <clears throat> Drop down to verse 30, same chapter. <clears throat> For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So, his love is so enduring and so intimate that he loves us as the same as his own body. The church becomes his body, put it that way. He nourishes it. He'll sacrifice for it. He'll do everything for it because of his overwhelming love. Now, in that respect, he's talking about the church as a whole. Elders and priests and the bride. But what we see here, there is a distinction given within the church. <clears throat> Turn back to Revelation, the first chapter. We're going to look at verse 20 now. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So what you're looking at, the number seven is the number of completion. So he's talking about the church as a whole, connoted by the candlesticks. When you look at the scripture here, go back to verse 16. Same chapter, verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. <clears throat> Let 
He says that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks are the seven churches. The only thing in his right hand are the stars. Where are the candlesticks? What does that mean? That means that the seven stars have favor that the candlesticks don't. He loves the church. He gives himself for the church. But the intimacy of the stars supersedes even the relationship with the other members of the church. So the, oneness, the oneness with the, with the um, stars. The seven stars have a unique intimacy that the others do not have. That's what the scripture is saying. Okay, I'll ask a question now. Sure, okay. Because it's kind of telling, look. So there's, there's letters that are written by Paul to the seven, the angels of the seven churches. That, that you know, the angel of John. The, John, 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 John. Sorry, yeah, in Revelation, sorry. Revelation, yeah, sorry about that. Um, that's having to do with all of this. Yes. It's just, it's just pretty amazing. Well, we're going to go on to try to try to clarify that. Yeah. What you want? What we want to stand here now is we're talking about the groups in the church, the Prototokos group. We dealt with the elders. We're dealing now with the priest angels. They have a unique place of favor intimacy that the others do not have. The angels, the stars, are placed in administrative authority over the churches. <clears throat> Why? Because they are in his right hand and the rest of the churches are not. Having said that, we want to go into a little depth of understanding of why. Scripture indicates God confers all revelation and intimate things into the hands of the angels first. They in turn present it to the elders. Why? Because of their intimate relationship. God will reveal things to them before he'll reveal things to the rest of the church membership. Verse 1, Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. You're going to get the page there. Yes. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. So God the Father gives God the Son this revelation. This is what the scripture is telling us. Now, Josie, you continue to read it. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it, oh, signified by his angel unto his servant John. Who does he give the revel who does the son give the revelation to? To an angel. Now, who is the angel? Uh, he sent Oh wait. Star. Star. The star? Star. Oh, Whoa. wait, that's so true. Wait a minute. The that's angel. Oh, wow, right? The angel is still <laughs> there. Oh. See that? Wait. Right? The sure, sure. They come to pass and, and he sent the and signified angel. it. The seven Star stars. Angel. <laughs> he's a star. He's a angel. Yeah, he's, he's a star. Servant John. He's a testimony of Jesus Christ and of all these things. My ways. Point. Why has been cooled in my right hand by the Lord? Can you develop that a little bit for these two? Why you distinguish they, Because they're going to come across the passage yeah. and they're going to, it's going to be confusing. You're going to distinguish between the angels that are part of the creation and the angels that are the prototokis group. The way you distinguish is is by the scripture that you're reading. We're going to go into that, as a matter of fact, in a couple of scriptures to come. 
You can see how the Lord looks at the Prototokos angel and how he looks at the created angel in some scriptures that we're going to yes. come to. We want to establish this right now, though. This angel has favor with the Son, demonstrating that the angels, the angel priests of the Prototokos, all have preeminent favor in the totality of the church. We're not including the bride because the bride is not part of the church. The bride is part of the bridegroom. Part of the what? The bridegroom. It doesn't become the bride until she's in heaven yeah. anyway. Now, turn to Revelation 22, verse 6. This principle is repeated. Verse 6. Josie, read it. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Revelation comes through the star group first. Then it goes to the aspects of the churches. Now we find that the Lord holds the Prototokos angels in high, high, high regard. Because they are the only group that the Lord himself calls holy. The Lord. Turn to Matthew 25, verse 31. Dara, when you get there, you read it. Okay. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. All the holy then. angels. So he's talking about the Prototokos, the stars. Turn to Matthew 24. Turning. Are any created angels described ever as holy? No. We're going to give examples of it. Matthew 24, verse 30 to 31. 31. Okay. And he shall send his angels right. with a great... Hold it right there. Okay. This is referring to the created angels. He shall send his angels. No holy, nothing there. Why? Because they're not the prototokis angels. You can always tell by the scripture we are talking about. These are the servant angels wow. that will do whatever they're bid to do commanded to do. So you can tell by the scripture who is who. Wow. And you also call them ministering angels? 
Yeah, they're called ministering angels in uh, Hebrew. Hebrews. Now, turn to the book of First Timothy. Paul understood this principle also. First Timothy, fifth chapter. When you get to 1 Timothy, the 5th chapter, we want verse 21. I change, I change thee. I charge. I charge thee. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the elect angel. That's it. That's all. Okay. <clears throat> Paul understood the prototokos, just as Jesus understands the prototokos, because Jesus taught Paul. The elect angels are the holy angels, mm. are the stars. They are the preeminent group in <clears throat> the prototokos. Peter understand no. the word elect. No. He, he, he understood elect, but not in the same. Not in the Tertullus. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Paul understood, and this is a principle that we're going to try to grab and run with. Paul understood that it would be, always be, the elect angels that first received the revelation. Turn to Ephesians, third chapter, verse four to five. In the church, there are no angels, but in the church, we have a group of revelators that always receive first from the Father and they pass it on. Ephesians, third chapter, verse four to five. <clears throat> Josie, when you get there, read it. All right. It says, whereby when you read, he may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That's it. The apostles and the prophets on earth today are the counterparts of the angels in the heavens. He says holy apostles. Mm -hmm. apostles. Yes, because that's what they are. Can you reiterate the fact that the angels are counterparts? Turn to Revelation 22. Verse 8 to 9. You read it when you get there, Chris. Thank you. It's an honor. <laughs> He's like, I love to read my Bible. And we read. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. It's the prophets on earth that are the counterparts of the angels in the heavens. Turn to Acts. Excuse me, not Acts. Turn to uh, First Peter, first chapter, verse 10 to 12. First Peter, 
First chapter, 10 to 12. Peter here talking about the salvation, ultimate deliverance. It's going to come to the church. I'm going to read when you get there. First Peter, first chapter, ten to twelve. Okay. Thank you. Of which salvation or deliverance the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the prophets received revelation knowledge of the challenges, of the persecutions that the church would encounter, the sufferings of Christ, and then they gave the church a heads up about what the church could expect. Then he goes on to say, unto whom it was revealed, and not only unto the, not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. What is he saying here? The prophets gave the revelation to those that needed it and those that needed it passed it on to those that were further away that needed it. The prophets were the revelators to the apostles and others of the things that would happen. We see examples of that. Turn to Acts 13, verse 1. Acts 13, verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 to, 1 to 2, Acts 13. Just before we read, Acts, yes. mm -hmm. somebody's going to ask at some point whether the earthly counterparts receive, I'm talking about the prophets, the earthly counterparts receive directly from their heavenly counterparts. No, they receive from the Holy Spirit. I understand that, but I'm saying somebody's going to ask that question. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking for it. No, they receive from the Holy Spirit. Okay, you don't want to expand on that. <laughs> Well, we don't want to detract too far, but okay. basically the, 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 the system is that the counterpart is not directly involved because his counterpart on earth has to qualify. So in that respect, the counterpart in heaven has to stay out of it. The counterpart on earth is directly connected to Christ who went through the first sufferings to blaze the trail for this one to go through the sufferings the same way Christ did under the aegis of the Holy Spirit that is in him. Uh, I have yeah. a question, forgive me. So the, um, the prophets is uh, the counterparts of the angels in heaven? Yes. So what does a counterpart mean? It means <sighs> the individual who is your representation in another location. Okay, another room. Okay, got it. Um, an example. If you are doing something in behalf of somebody else, and that somebody else is actively working in your behalf to enable you to do what you're doing that's your counterpart 
you are initiating something, the counterpart is helping you, the two are acting in a coordinated manner, representing one. Mm -hmm. You take a part of you and you split that part off, and that part is still you, but you're not directly connected in the sense of you can't see your counterpart. Your counterpart is somebody, someplace else working or doing something, but it's representing you where you are and what you are doing. Thank you. Let's go on. Dara has a question. Please. Uh, I have a question. Sorry. Yes, sure. Sorry. So when then, in a way, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we, God, the Father, be the counterpart of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then? Because they're separate, but they're one, is they're one and two. But they're not the same person. Jesus is a counterpart in heaven, mm -hmm. uh, which is, how can I say it? When he left his glory, put it that way, mm -hmm. and he come down to earth, he separated from himself. He gave up a part of himself that was still him, but he's here. He's not here in the same way that he was in heaven, because if he were, he couldn't represent man on earth. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He becomes a part that's separated from who he actually is. Okay, Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Serene and Menem, which had been with they had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And they, the prophets, the teachers, ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. These are the counterparts of the stars that are in the heavens that have incarnated on the earth to qualify for the sonship position. Prophets had an instrumental function in the life of the apostles. The prophets ministered to the apostles. Uh, Acts 21. Okay. Acts 21. Verse 10. To 12. As we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, bound him, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem. Bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. The prophets ministered to the apostles. Peter credits the prophets with talking about the sufferings that the church is going to endure as a result of the revelation they were receiving from the Holy Ghost that they passed on to the churches. Here we see an example, prophet ministering to an apostle. Why? Because the apostles' basic function was to direct the churches. They had revelation comprehension, but they didn't have the time to focus totally on revelation. They had to direct and uh, enable the church, whether Jew or Gentile, to grow. So the prophet's main job was to receive revelation and to instruct the churches, prepare the churches for those things that were going to come, uh, the things were going to suffer so that the churches could prepare for it and endure it when it did come. Acts 21. Acts 21. 10 to 12. <clears throat> so 
So you get a you get a a slight comprehension here. What you do, you make these scriptures yours. You find your place in the scheme. Are you an elder? Are you a, a, a star? Where do you fit in all this? It's your destiny. It's your future. What you do with it is going to determine where you're going to be in eternity. That's what I tell everybody about these scriptures. They're given to us so we could prepare ourselves for a glory. This thing is going to only happen one time. You miss it, that's it. There's not going to be a second chance. But if you take it and run with it, make it your number one priority in this life, you'll never regret it. If you put your relationship with Jesus Christ in front of everything, make sure you have your relationship with Jesus Christ. Ask him, which one am I? Show me the way. Point the way. Make it obvious to me. Get, let me understand where I am in your kingdom. If you talk with Jesus the same way as if you sit right here, you're assuring your relationship with him and you will get the answer you seek. If you seek. If you don't seek, then you'll just be wandering from here until eternity. When I was about 12 years old, I sat down with an atlas, star atlas, all the constellations, the solar system, the galaxies, and I, I talked to the Lord. I said, I want to know what there is out there. I want to know everything. Maybe about a week later, I started to get revelation, visitations, all sorts of things. God will answer your prayer but you got to be serious with the Lord it's got to be your number one priority the enemy is going to try to distract you I've been telling you this since you've been coming he's going to try to distract you he's going to try to deceive you any way he can right. <clears throat> he's going to try to put fear in you if he thinks that'll work or uh, he's going to try to put allurement if he thinks that'll work he'll do anything he can pull out all stops to keep you from entering into what God's called you to do. God hands it to you. He says, this is it. Choose what you want to do. And he'll back up whatever you want to do if you commit to him. So prophets have their counterpart as an angel in heaven, just like priests do as well. Right? Elders too. And elders as well. But the elders have an angel in heaven that's their counterpart? They have a... Oh my goodness. It's not an angel. It's a glorified saint okay. that's their counterpart. That's represented by that number that's only symbolic because it represents many more people than 24. the actual number itself. Yes. yes. It means if you're a prototokus, you have a counterpart in heaven.